Uh, working with my father, uh, it's it's good and bad. Presents lots of lots of different opportunities. It's, I feel a bit like uh, I get asked that question a bit. Um, it's a bit like the after-match function when you're captain in a footy team. You have to say nice things about the enemy. <laughs> but, um, but no, it's, it's not like that. I think exactly the same problems I had working with my father. I've got some empathy with it. Um, I think the, the older generation uh, gets a bit more stuck in its ways. Um, and uh, But if you haven't got the next generation questioning, then I think you do get dopey and you go to sleep. Yeah, one, one of the reasons we're still here after 151 years is probably that my great-grandfather selected one of the best bits of dirt in the valley. And uh, at the end of the day, you want to make great wine, you've got to have, you've got to have the right country to grow the grapes on it. And we've been lucky enough to start with that and, and to continue to build on it over the years. You know, as you drive up the hill here, uh, the two blocks were planted in 1892 and 1879. And I'm told by one of the industry historians that that those, those are first generation cuttings from the hill at Hermitage. Now, the French haven't got them anymore. They're all on Californian rootstock and they taste like Coca-Cola. The Tyrrell family are responsible for the start of Chardonnay of modern time in Australia. 1971 was the first VAT 47 that was released, but 60s, well, it was before that, mid-60s, um, found the cutting, found where we wanted to get cuttings. Uh, but it belonged to Penfolds and we asked them three times and three years in a row and they said no. So the third time we snuck in and nicked them. And, um, and I just found out the other day that the Drayton family actually had planted Chardonnay two years before us. And I'm buggered if I know why we didn't get them from them. <laughs> and ironically we now own that vineyard, Penfolds sold it to us. Yeah, one I've got here, some Vat 9 of 1998. Uh, Hunter Sherrard based on well, the old vineyard on this red hill that, where we're standing now. And, and these are, you know, it's like the Semillon. These are, these are not like other wines in this country. This is not part of the generalisation of Australian wine. The Hunter's one of those, the great area, because we are unique and different. And we're, we're lighter to medium bodied and we're spicy and we're savoury. And the wines are based on acid rather than tannin and they live. Semillon's the white variety that we do in the Hunter that nobody else in the world can do as well. And, uh, and about 20 odd years ago, I suddenly realised that we had the opportunity to work with something that was totally unique. And not a lot of people anywhere in the world get that opportunity. And so I went out of the way to, to get hold of the best vineyards I could. There are, there are six, I think, six great Simulon vineyards in the valley, and I've got five of them now. And What's the sixth? I love Dale. And McWilliams probably won't sell it to me as yet. But uh, <laughs> we'll I did talk to, talk to Don McWilliam about if McWilliams ever sold up, would, would he let me buy Lovedale separately? And that I would keep him in good drinking for the rest of his life. And he thought that was a pretty good idea. But um, I, a few years ago here, at dinner with the Hunter Valley Wine Show and Jancis Robinson was the, uh, was the special guest judge. And she said to me, is Semillon still, is still a passion for Semillon here that there always was? And I said, it's never been a passion, it's been a bloody obsession. Uh, the Semillon and Seafood Festival that was held here last weekend um, was a brainchild of ours and one a member of our staff, Arthur Wallen, uh, which was to promote the two things that fit so well in this area, which is Semillon and, and pretty much any form of seafood. So we had about 40 local wineries, a whole heap of local restaurants, um, general tasting, master classes, cooking schools, you name it, we had it. This year we've had uh, Eric Clapton, we've had The Who, we've had a whole string of great artists. Last year, Elton John and, uh, and Rod Stewart were the lead acts through the area. But it's just, the Hunter now is, is the biggest tourist destination outside Sydney and New South Wales. And, and that all runs around the wine industry. Why has a family wine company got that competitive advantage? Oh. Well, you can, you can you go. go. No, you take it. There you go. You take, there you, you, take, go. You, take, you take it. You were going to say? Um, I wasn't to, um, more so not the advantage of being a family company. Uh, I think, uh, well, but touching on that, I think a lot of people can relate to it, you know, especially in a marketing sense. It needs to get out there a bit more. But, um, you know, we live in a world of, you know, mergers and acquisitions and huge corporate takeovers and stuff. And I think, uh, you know, people want to support a family. It's the Australian way, support the support the battler and all that sort of stuff. Not that a lot of the families are struggling, but uh, you know, it's good to it's 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 a it's a connection. You know, you're not 
there's a story behind it, you know. Family companies, you look at uh, your decisions are not entirely economic. They are, uh, you know, it's more socially based. I suppose you look at people that are that have been with you for a period of time, and if they get sick, then you look after them. It's those are the, I suppose, you treat them like a family, and uh, and you hope that you get the the same feeling in return. The family businesses are where innovation will come, um, because the lawyers and the big companies won't allow it. Um, and, and we've got to be the face. We've got to come back, Australia's, to be what Australians are, open, friendly, have a bit of fun, but do things better than everyone else.